Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, it's Sean, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. In the year 2000, we had immigrated to New Zealand, and in 2001, we went back to sell our house and tidy up everything. That's when I met my friend Rajesh Thakur. He started out being a client, and then later on, he became a friend. And he was thoroughly interested in how much our lives had changed once we had gotten from quite noisy Mumbai to very quiet New Zealand. And so he was considering immigrating here himself and was exploring the options. Now, Rajesh is not a small business. He owns several factories, he has several hundred people working for him, and he thought, well, I can just replicate that idea here in Auckland or some part of New Zealand. And he said, how about you help me? As in, he was asking for my help. But like all businessmen, you look at risk and you say, what if it doesn't work? So what he was trying to do was to mitigate the risk, to validate that his idea would work in New Zealand just like it had in India. And here's what I said to him. I said, we could do everything by the book. We could get staff, we could set up the factory, we could start up production, as in for him, not for me. And then he wasn't sure. He was like, what if this idea works in India and doesn't work in New Zealand? So how do you validate that idea? And the funny thing is that validation does exist. It exists for a business. You know that a business is going to succeed because of what other people say. And this podcast is about the validation that you get from your peers. How do you know that you've got a great idea? How do you know that the idea will work? How do you know that you will succeed? And that's what this episode of the podcast is doing. It's showing you how to go about figuring out validation in advance. This is the second rerun of eight podcasts. So we did one last week, and now this is the second one. And then after this, six more to go. This is episode number 138. And it's part two of how to validate your idea. Now in 137, we looked at how to validate your idea. We started out with how to distinguish between your own voice of fear and the voice of reason. And then we went on to how to validate your idea. And we looked at two parts. And the parts were just how you can create your own product, your own service, and then link it to an existing problem. And we also looked at the power of peers, the people that are in your own industry and how they help most of all. In this episode, we look at analysis paralysis and how we can get over that, or at least the tips on how to get over it. So here we go, episode number 138. Which trigger played a significant role in human evolution? If we go back three million years to our early ancestors, we run into Australopithecus, and we find them to be more like a chimpanzee. The brain volume is a bare 400 cc. But then, if we were to fast forward to 1.8 million years ago, suddenly there's an abundance of hominine species, including Homo erectus. And the brain size, it's double of Australopithecus. If we move further to 800,000 years ago, we run into Homo heidelbergensis, and there's another remarkable growth in brain size. It goes from 800 cc to 1200 cc. And finally, 200,000 years ago, we find a skull called Homo II, and it has a brain size of approximately 1500 cc, which is remarkably close to the brain size that we have today.
But what caused those changes in brain sizes? Every one of those brain sizes, those changes, they occurred when the earth was at its most elliptical and the climate was horribly harsh and changing. Rivers dried up, food was scarce, temperatures rose and fell in rapid succession. Human evolution is considered to have a direct line to volatile do-or-die situations. Good times, on the other hand, don't seem to lend themselves to rapid change. Think about your situation on a daily basis. As long as you have enough food in the pantry, it seems perfectly reasonable to lounge on the sofa. The moment you're out of food, there is no analysis paralysis. In fact, even dwindling supplies causes you to act with increasing focus and rapidity. While there may be many reasons why we get into a rut of analysis paralysis, the biggest reason for the rut is excess. So what does this excess look like in real life? Let's say you walked into an ice cream parlor and you have to choose between two flavors, mango and strawberry. How long did it take you to make that decision? If we wanted to add confusion, we simply have to add excess. So let's add 18 flavors to that list. Now you have 20 flavors to choose from and you go, at least partially, into analysis paralysis. You want coffee flavor, you want mango at the same time. You can't decide whether they are suitable and so back and forth you go. In reality, you're going through a series of rejections. To get to your unique flavor, you have to theoretically reject 19 flavors. To pick that one, you have to reject 19 flavors. A similar set of phenomena plays itself out when you're trying to achieve a goal. You've been told that it's important to learn about Facebook advertising, that email is important, storytelling is critical, and so on. It's normal to jump from one thing to another, like flavors of an ice cream. What you really need is a lack of choice. People who get things done are not hampered because they create situations where they cannot do everything. They are forced to do just a few things with usually one thing as the big focus. And if you want to get out of analysis paralysis, there are three elements that you need to consider. The first is drafts, the second is information, and the third is the deadline. Let's start with drafts. Michael Lewis is a relatively unknown name as authors go, but his projects, they're well known because his projects are quickly transformed into Hollywood blockbusters. Moneyball, The Big Short, The Blind Sight, these are reasonably well-known movies. And when Lewis was interviewed by Stephen Dubner on the Freakonomics podcast, this is what he said about drafts. I hate to ruin your punchline, but it, it actually, what's hard for me is figuring out in the beginning what I want to say. I spend a lot of time gathering material and organizing the material before I sit down to write. I'd say three quarters of the time is that. When the actual writing starts, it's, for me, fun. It's just fun. I mean, it's fun and hard, but it's, in, if it's hard, it's hard in a fun way. In layman's terms, what Lewis is talking about is simply an outline. Yes, the very same outline that people hated to do when they were at school, and they still avoid doing, whether it involves writing an article, creating a product, or giving a presentation. It's one of the biggest hurdles that get in our way time and time again. An outline has stages of clarification. When we first begin the draft, we are grasping at straws. With every following outline, the brain has a chance of getting a greater level of clarity. Three, four, six, eight. It doesn't matter how many drafts you create, as long as you create drafts. Now, when you're talking about analysis paralysis, drafts don't seem to make any sense. So let's take an analogy like a grocery list. 
because once we have that grocery list, we have an easier time understanding the concept. So let's say you show up at the market randomly and you end up buying stuff that you don't need or don't want and then you're confused what do you want to buy. But let's say you did a little prep work and that prep work, your grocery list, it goes a long way. But a grocery list is pretty simple. And when you look at an article or a project or a book, now there's so much more complexity there. And it's so easy to merrily walk into these projects without going through a bunch of drafts. J.K. Rowling, who wrote Harry Potter, she had zillions of drafts. Michael Lewis pretty much works that way going forward with the drafts. Pixar, Disney, Every animation company will create storyboard after storyboard. The reason why professionals work their way through drafts is for one simple reason. When you start a project, your brain has a random set of ideas. It's very easy to get stuck and no one, not you or me, likes being in that situation. But once you're in that situation, you get distracted and something seemingly easier shows up and of course you take that but now we have a situation of analysis paralysis so you have to go with these drafts up to a deadline of course and then you get to the project itself and drafts are only one of the elements that we have to deal with when working on a project the second big thing is the lack of information so let's look at the lack of information shall we Let's see how it plays a role in analysis paralysis. Back in 2009, I rewrote version 3 of the book, The Brain Audit. It should have been an easy task. After all, I'd been through hundreds of examples of clients using The Brain Audit. I'd also spent years refining the concepts over and over and over again. Then I implemented it in my own business. But even as I'm describing the trouble of writing version 3, you're getting a feeling of deja vu, aren't you? And it's because most of us have experienced this struggle of having to explain the same thing in a different way. We know too much. We have the curse of knowledge, and it slows us down considerably. Knowing too much means that you feel the need to stuff everything into your information. Let's take the brain audit itself as an example. The book is pretty comprehensive all by itself. However, if you look at the chapters, and there are about seven main chapters, every one of those chapters can be a book all by itself. How do we know this to be true? Let's take the chapter on uniqueness. Now, we've conducted a three-day workshop on uniqueness alone, and it has its own separate audio and its own separate notes. If we were to choose the topic of testimonials, there's a book, The Secret Life of Testimonials, that has over 100 pages. Any of these chapters of the Brain Audit could be expanded into 100 or 150 pages each. This book, The Brain Audit, could easily become a thousand-page book. As a writer, there's too much information. There's too much information floating in your head. If you were to take any topic, such as photography or gardening or computers, you'd find that it's very hard to nail it down. Even an esoteric topic, like for instance, I remember taking on a topic like feedback. Now, that's pretty esoteric. And that generated well over 10 chapters. The more info product you have in your head, the more you're going to get derailed. Which is why it's a good practice to write down all your ideas and then just choose three of them. Which three? It doesn't matter. Any three will do. Any three will connect. All of the three are valuable to clients, but more importantly for you as the creator. Most software is bloated, most books are loaded with information that we just can't use. If we had just three topics to focus on, we could get going as creators. 
However, this is for the person who's well down the road. What if you're just starting out? Around 2000, a client of mine wrote his first book. In that book, he put everything he knew, which wasn't a lot. He was exhausted by the time he finished the book. But he was also scared. He felt that he'd given his all and there was nothing left to give. When I wrote The Brain Audit back in 2002, I felt the same way. I couldn't manage more than 16 to 20 pages, and that included fillers and cartoons. Today, you can see that I have the problem in reverse. If I were to write The Brain Audit like it should be written, I'd struggle to keep it down to fewer than a thousand pages. All of us believe that we either have too much in our heads or too little. But there's also a third factor that comes into play, and that leads directly into analysis paralysis. So when you look at a product like dartboard pricing, well, it shows you why people pick your products over other people's, how to construct pricing, etc. Now, the point about this book was that when I was going to write this book, I didn't know why I should be writing this book. There are so many articles that I've already written on pricing. So why would a client buy a book on top of that? And then some strange thoughts enter our heads. We feel we've already told the story, that we've already written enough articles about it, that another book or another course on that topic will not make a difference. And incredibly, it does make a massive difference. I could sell the dartboard pricing series as it is, I'd do a webinar series and clients would still sign up. I could do a workshop in a city and people would still sign up. How do we know this to be true? Because when I was presenting the Brain Audit Workshop in Washington, D.C. for the first time, and this was many years ago, I was going through the same fear-ridden routine. Most of the attendees in the room had not only read the Brain Audit, but they had version 1, version 2, and version 3. So what else could I bring to the table? But there's always a new angle. There are new examples. There are new insights that you, as a creator, don't even realize you're putting forth when you're speaking or when you're communicating. Even if you've published a lot of the information before, the audience receives it from a completely different angle. So to get going, you must start with drafts. Write down all the ideas in draft after draft. Even so, the draft must have a deadline by which time you start writing. When you write, put everything down into three categories. What can you fit in those three categories? Instead of writing endless stuff, just keep it down to those three categories. And finally, the biggest thing that stops us in our tracks is the information that already exists. Either we have put the information out there or someone else has, and we think that no one else needs our product or service. As alluring as this fact may appear to us, it is patently false. There are many ways to present the very same information, the very same product, the very same service, and clients want that product, that service from you. But even if you were to conquer that fear of drafts and get over the hurdles of information, we still have one more hurdle, one more bridge to conquer. And that is the concept of deadlines. So let's look at why external deadlines reduce paralysis analysis. Let's say we went back to that supermarket with our list. But now it's not a typical list. That list has about 150 to 200 items which you need to purchase. Now it's not some kind of treasure hunt. All you have to do is pick item after item from the shelf and put it in your shopping cart. Even so, as you get deeper into the list, there is this overpowering urge to quit the task and go and do something else. Any project, a decent sized project, usually has about 150 to 200 embedded tasks. We start off the project with a lot of gusto and then for no particular reason we seem to lose momentum. Then we get distracted. 
the more distraction we run into, the more we seek to do some research. We somehow feel if we do our homework, things will get better, and they rarely do. The only consistent way to get things done is to adopt the mindset of a programmer. Any programmer on a project knows that there is a date to ship the software. Will the software have bugs? Almost certainly it will have a fair number of bugs. A programmer has very little choice. They've promised the software will be ready on a specific date, and so it launches more or less on time. But this deadline isn't restricted to programmers alone. You get to your destination because planes and trains and buses, they're mostly on a non-negotiable deadline. The Olympics don't start one week late, they start on time. And even those 200 things you had to get off the shelves needed to be put there by someone who was following an external plan. If you make internal plans, paralysis analysis is the default setting. When I first started writing articles for Psychotactics, I hated writing with a passion. It would take me two days and involve so much time, so much energy, and yet I do it because I promised that I'd deliver the article on a twice monthly basis, and so I had to finish the job. I'd battle through the process, hating every fifth word with passion, but the job would get done. Almost all of us start off on a project with a lot of excitement, and then we struggle to get to the finish line. When we have nothing to lose, we fill our days with something else. The only way anything can get done is to have this external deadline in place. Most of the time, it should involve a cash transaction. When you sell a course, you have to show up and conduct the course. When you promise to deliver software, you'd better be shipping on the day itself or clients will be on your tail. But then you think, wait, what about the pressure? Isn't this all a source of constant pressure? Sure it is, but great work is not done when you have loads of leisure time. The advice that is being given to you isn't particularly new. You already know that a project is going to have 200 subtasks. You have to work out the tasks, and you have to go at it with gusto. You also know that if you keep the project to yourself, nothing is going to happen. Very few people have the ability to finish anything if there isn't a fixed deadline. Very few people will do anything if there isn't a penalty to get the job done. And whatever you're shipping is going to have bugs. You can fix those bugs later. There's just one tiny note left. We often underestimate the time that we need. We take on too much and then we struggle. Over the years, I've had to learn that making space is an important part of getting things done. If you're constantly battling all sorts of deadlines, you're running out of energy on a monumental scale. Without space, you have no recovery period. So what I do is I create space, and then I set an external deadline. And that's how things get done. Is this too simple? Well, here's a sobering parting thought. Michelangelo didn't want to paint the Sistine Chapel. Leonardo da Vinci didn't want to paint, didn't want to finish the Last Supper. They were made to do it. That's why we have these works of art. That's why you have to create your work of art. Now get out there, get out of that analysis paralysis, get 70% done and get the job finished. But we're not done with the podcast yet. There's a little epilogue and it's the Segway Syndrome. One of the most spectacular failures of modern times has been the Segway. In a world that longs for non-polluting transportation systems, the Segway seemed like the perfect answer to our travel needs. It moved swiftly, quietly, and after a bit of practice, it was relatively easy to handle. Even so, Segway sales barely got off the ground and have stayed relatively stagnant. 
If it's evident that the segue solves a problem, why should it have failed? Sometimes the problem lies not in the product or service itself, but in the distribution or infrastructure instead. Take, for instance, the electric car. In 2017, a Tesla now has the ability to go 335 miles on a single charge. Compare that with a gas-burning fuel car that can only do about 300. That, to many people, is the infrastructure part that needs to be taken care of. And yet, that's not enough. Superchargers have to be built so that they can quickly replace gas stations. And these superchargers, they need to sit near cafes or stores or in a parking lot. Without all of these elements in place, the car itself becomes redundant. The Segway struggled for many reasons, including its high price. However, even if you did own a Segway, you couldn't use it on the road, you couldn't use it on the pavement. Without setting all the infrastructure and paperwork in place, it was doomed to failure. And this brings us to an important point, creating a factor of destruction. When we try to validate an idea, we head in one direction. We list all the reasons why the idea, the product, or the service can and should succeed. But do we ever sit down and create conditions for failure? If you're about to do a copywriting course, what can you do to cause the course to fail? What infrastructure would you need to remove so that the course crashes and burns? If you're starting up a website business, what would you need to have in place so that clients show interest but still don't do any work with you? These are the elements that we have to consider before we put our product or service into the marketplace. They don't have to be perfect, but you have to think of creative destruction. And that's because ideas are super fragile. The creator of the product or service may waffle between fear and reason when in fact everyone who launches a product is fearful. Everyone, without exception, feels the same uncertainty. Then we have the issue of validating the product, validating the service. And for most of us, it's impossible. However, your fellow creators, your peers, they can help you. They can give you this powerful form of feedback. And later, when the product launches, clients will tell you what you need to fix. Instead of pretending that the problem doesn't exist, we need to roll up our sleeves. We need to fix the problems. Finally, there's the issue of analysis and, yes, paralysis. Those that do endless research and wait for the right moment almost always fail. Instead, you'll need to set yourself a deadline, you'll need to get your product or service into the market, and you'll need to fix the glitches later. Pre-selling the product or service ensures that you keep to the deadline and you don't wait forever. The great works of genius in science and maths and language and arts, they're not fully formed when they come out. They're mostly half-baked and they got better as they went along. You may decide to start later when things are perfect, but it's a decision, and it's a decision that almost never has a good ending. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. Let's do a quick summary, shall we? Imagine if you invented a set of tires and they were ridiculed. They were called pudding tires. Would you go ahead? Now you can because of the information that we've covered so far. So what did we cover? We covered three things. How to distinguish between your own voice of fear and the voice of reason. And the voice of fear is always looking at the big picture, how everything unfolds. And the voice of reason, it's looking at the road ahead. It has a fuzzy understanding of the endpoint, but it's always looking at the road ahead. Then it comes to validating your idea. Now, when you validate your idea, you go to your peers or you just create a product and make sure that a problem already exists. That problem doesn't have to be connected to your product itself. So in the secret life of testimonials, the problem is about getting better clients. No connection, but it fits. In the article writing course, 
It's about how to get clients to call you and that's how you write articles. No connection, but it fits. So that's how you can create something that you want and then get it to fit. And finally, we looked at analysis paralysis. Start with drafts, get going, sell in advance, and just ship the product. And fix it later. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. So what's happening in Psychotactics land? When I was a kid, I was absolutely gobsmacked by karate. Well, I thought that Bruce Lee did karate. He didn't. But him and Gojin Yamaguchi, who was the cat, and I thought he was also called the living god of karate. Anyway, I was obsessed with this martial art. And what was interesting was the sequence. So you couldn't just step in and go, give me a green belt, give me an orange belt. You had to go through some sort of sequence. And to me, that always stayed in my mind. And when we started out psychotactics, I didn't set out for the brain audit to be like the starting point. I just wrote the brain audit to help myself, to help me write my own sales pages or to create my own kind of system. But over the years, it has become both the starting point and the barrier. So clients that come to our workshop have to have read the brain audit. They have to have a copy of the brain audit. And it also helps when clients get into 5000 BC. As you probably know, 5000 BC is our membership site. It's where introverts meet. But they talk about sales pages. They talk about how to sell to clients. And many of the conversations hover around the concepts in the brain audit. So if you haven't already read the brain audit, then this is a good time to do so. You can get it on Amazon, or you can also get it on our own site at psychotactics.com slash brain audit. And then from there on, you could join a course or you could join 5000 BC. You have effectively gone over that barrier that we put in place. So start out with the brain audit. It's a really good read, lots of stories, lots of cartoons, and a butter chicken recipe. It's also the starting point if you want to get the information products or the article writing course or uniqueness. So that's for next year. The information products will be available on the 25th of Jan, 2018. The article writing course called the toughest writing course in the world. That will go on sale on 15th of March. And then we have uniqueness how to create your uniqueness so the clients cannot copy your uniqueness. And that's on the 22nd of May, 2018. So these are all waiting lists. 25th of Jan, 15th of March, 22nd of May. Without reading the brain audit or getting on the waiting list, you won't see any of these products on our site. So that's what you have to do. Start with the brain audit, go to the waiting list, fill in your details, and you're ready to go. And that's me, Sean D'Souza, saying bye for now. Bye-bye. Still listening? People often ask me, what do you do with a membership site when you're away? Because we're away three months in a year. So we work for 12 weeks, then we take a month off, another 12 weeks, month off. And so what do you do with the membership site? Because the promise that I make in the membership site of 5000 BC is that I am always there to answer your questions, to give complete answers, often write an article, two articles in response to your question. So suddenly I'm not around for a whole month and what happens then? The point is that I tried going back very early in the process, maybe 2006 or so, I tried going back to 5000 BC while I was supposed to be on vacation and I got thrown out. I got thrown out of my own membership site because clients said, what we're trying to do is achieve what you have achieved, which is to get more vacation time, to go on at least a month's vacation, if not three months. And you don't set a good example when you show up. So it's not like I've been a poster child for staying away from work. But over the years, I've learned, and now, of course, when we leave, we don't check email, we don't go to the membership site, but there is an interesting phenomenon when we go away. And Renuka sends an email to existing members 
and ask for volunteers, as in cave elves. And what they do is they help out, they further conversations, they answer questions. Cave elves, they really help while we're away. And this is a site, 5000 BC, like very few communities that you'll see online. It's very helpful, it's very kind, and the advice that you get and the courage that you get to move on is very important. So I would say join 5000 BC and by the time we get back, you can go through all the stuff and say hello to us when we get back in the new year. That's me, Sean D'Souza, saying bye for now. Bye-bye.